Oh, well, thanks everybody for coming. I'll keep them on. Um, I'm not used to speaking in front of the mic, so I'll do the best I can. I'm introducing Wolf tonight. <sighs> well, everybody, and welcome. I'm just absolutely floored. This is such a great turnout. Um, I'm Patricia Mitchell, Vice President of the Brattleboro Museum and Art Center. I'm honored and excited to introduce tonight Wolf Khan, an insightful and gifted painter, and also an eloquent writer and speaker. This evening's talk is, is titled, The Uses and Misuses of Painting. According to Wolf, painting has traditionally been about description, but always with an underlying concern with visual language. How the visual language is used determines the difference between good description and bad description. At the conclusion of Wolf's talk, you'll have the opportunity to ask many questions with a book and poster signing to follow. And now please welcome our good friend and neighbor, Wolf Kahn. Happiness is a full house. <laughs> um, although I think we're overdoing happiness if we have to send people home who can't get in because of the fire code. If, if it's up to me, I, I'd have somebody sitting there and somebody else sitting there and so forth, but can't be done. Um, well, my talk um, is really the title allows me to uh, give full vent to my rage and, and disappointment and upset with the state of the world and uh, state of myself because I'm getting so old and uh, just generally um, be bad tempered which elderly people are allowed to be. Um, however, I have to warn you that uh, I'm German by birth and even unfortunately sometimes by attitude. <laughs> Ask my wife and children. And um, um, the Germans have an unfortunate tendency to generalize. And as an artist, you're really not allowed to generalize because I think art has to do with particulars. And especially the kind of art that I was brought up on, which is abstract expressionism. And abstract expressionists believed that um, the most important part of art had to do with the moment. And um, that any you had to sort of clear your mind of everything you know and everything that you uh, wish to um, express beforehand in order to allow the spontaneous to, to come forward. Um, they believed in... I'm just going to do this a tiny bit. Okay. I'm sorry to interrupt. They believed in, in, in the, um, the subconscious above all, because abstract expressionism came out of surrealism. And surrealism felt that all art is really the expression, or should be, the expression of the subconscious. So that you had, uh, starting out with uh, poet Rimbaud, you had uh, artists using drugs in order to get into uh, some kind of a exalted state, or at least a state where their conscious intentions would be uh, not nearly as important as they are in everyday life. And some of that I still, I still kind of um, hold by because I think to know what you're doing is wrong. It's much better not to know what you're doing 
And as, as I said, as I said uh, to, to the writer of the article in The Reformer, incidentally, I, if as anybody here from The Reformer, I really want to thank them because I've had media overkill for the last two weeks. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I open the paper and if there's not an article about Wolf Kahn, I think, you know, what the, what's the matter with him, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, to, to get back, he started that article by uh, quoting me. I said that an artist should be a little stupid and a little childish and have a bad memory. <laughs> and the reason for all of this is you have to be stupid to wish to be an artist anyway because, <laughs> because the statistics for you ever making a go of it are very strongly against you. You know, they're almost as bad as being hit by lightning. Um, and, this, and then you have to be a little childish because if you're, if you're so sophisticated and know so well what's going on, then you're never going to have the kind of innocence of spirit which I think an artist sort of has to have, you know, which children, of course, are born with. And it's only our um, uh, civilization with its discontents, as Freud said, that drives the innocence out of all of us. You know? um, and then to have a bad memory, I think, is extraordinarily useful. <laughs> because you don't remember that you have done the same painting once before. <laughs> And this gives you, since you don't remember it, that gives you, uh, keeps you from having a guilty conscience <laughs> to keep knocking them out over and over again. Um, at a certain point, then you start um, looking over your work and you're saying, gee, you know, it all looks the same. Well, it looks the same because of your bad memory. <laughs> so, um, uh, this, this to explain my first, the first sentence of that article. Um, then I also want to say before I start really letting go, I want to say that take, take everything I say with a grain of salt, with a bit of skepticism, because like I say, you can't give a lecture, especially when, when you look at this crowd of people, it's so impressive, you know. I mean, the last time there was a huge crowd like that, it was uh, uh, Governor Coonan and Galway Canal, you know. And even then, I don't think they had quite as many, because I don't think they had as many seats that they could uh, 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 rent elsewhere. So, so the thing is that um, take it with a grain of salt and take everything that I say um, as being a momentary kind of thing, because I keep changing my mind. And of course, having a bad memory makes that much easier. Because <laughs> uh, you don't remember what you, what you thought the day before. And, uh, but again, the bad memory is helpful because as, a, as an artist, one of your obligations which, of course, you can never fulfill. Most of the obligations you have in an as an artist, you can never fulfill. Uh, so you can, you know, you never have to have a guilty conscience. Um, but one of the obligations you really can never fulfill is to be born afresh every day. And yet, somehow or other, that's what has to happen. That's what has to happen. Because if you're not, if you don't have the feeling that you're discovering something new all the time and surprising yourself, then you get the sense that you're a performer rather than an inventor or a, a creator. You know, although I hate that word creator. You know, there's only one creator. He's up there somewhere. And uh, artists are not creators. We're workmen. You know, we're workmen. Um, we're workmen with a kind of, you might say, with a privilege. Because one of, the privilege, one of the privileges that society gives us is to uh, listen only to ourselves, you know. But of course, it's awfully difficult to listen just to yourself because there's so much noise all about. 
But once you have a, a few strokes of paint on, on, on a canvas and uh, the paint starts speaking to you, then you listen to the paint. And the paint, it's, it's, it's like a uh, you know, substitute for yourself. And after a while, you think you're, you're listening to yourself when you're painting. You know, and, and, and the rest of the world sort of gets pushed, pushed to the margins. And that's when you really uh, begin to do halfway decent work. I won't say you necessarily do good work, uh, because for that, all kinds of other things have, have, have to happen. You have to um, have a painting at a certain saturation point with paint before it even starts speaking to you. You know, at least I do. Other people, of course, can do it very differently. Helen Frankenthaler, who is a um, um, uh, colleague of mine, in her best work, I think her best paintings, when you look at them, they took about 10 minutes. Um, except then, then she decided she's going to make very huge paintings, you know, and if you have a very huge surface to deal, it would take at least a half an hour to make a painting, you know. Uh, and, then, and then I guess a guilty conscience started to, to raise its ugly head, although I don't know whether that's really true, I'm just guessing. And she started working a little harder on her paintings, and they immediately became less good. You know, it's astonishing how, it, but I'm not like that. The harder I work on a painting, the better it gets, un, until I throw it away. <laughs> you know, sometimes you overwork a painting, you have to throw it away, you know. But you have to have the faith that by going back in and, and giving it another shot and another shot, because you constantly see new things that you have to do on it. Um, Robert Motherwell, uh, one of the uh, first generation abstract expressionists, he was asked, well, how do you know when you finished a painting? Good question, you know, because most of us don't. Uh, we either underwork it or overwork it. But Motherwell had a good answer. He said, my painting proceeds by a series of mistakes. And once I get to a point where I have a mistake that I can't correct, then the painting's finished. <laughs> but there's a certain amount of truth to it. I mean, in other words, if you, if you look at the painting and you have a feeling, well, you, 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 you're at some sort of an impasse or you're at, at some sort of a place where the painting no longer tells you what it wants to do. What it, what it wants you to do, then you better stop, you know, because you've done your job. And then sometimes what ends up with that painting is a terrible painting, you know. And then you save that for, for uh, some really vulgar person to buy, you know. <laughs> I mean, I know exactly. Now I'm, I'm working on a picture right now which is much too colorful much too bright, and, um, and yet I say in the back of my head, I say, I should really destroy that picture. But then I say, oh, my dealer in Charlotte, he'd be so happy, you know, <laughs> because he's got so many people who like that kind of picture, you know. So it keeps, it keeps me um, from destroying the picture, although maybe by the end of the summer, I'll have enough uh, uh, good pictures that I can get rid of this one, overpaint it, or do something, you know. All right, now people, you know, many people don't think about art from one month to the next. And why should they? Because most of us don't have the, um, we don't really have the, the, the training in the language of art. And it does require a certain amount of training in the same way in which you have to have a certain amount of knowledge to uh, appreciate, let's say, classical music, you know, or maybe even jazz, because to, to, to a lot of people, jazz just is a lot of noise, and to, to a lot of people, classical music just all sounds the same, you know. Um, so uh, people try to nevertheless have an opinion. It's very important in America to have an opinion. Um, in school, in elementary school, you are already encouraged to have an opinion. 
what do you think, Johnny, um, is better, ice cream or marshmallows? And then Johnny raises his head. He says, marshmallows. And then Betty on the other side of the room, she raises her hand, ice cream. You know, and these people after that have these opinions for the rest of their life. You know, and uh, uh, in art, everybody has an opinion. It's because it's so easy, so easy. The, the, the easiest opinion is to hate it. You know, especially modern art, you know, because it's ugly, it, you don't understand it, you have a feeling that people are pulling your leg, and um, um, so, so, so you say, um, I don't like it, it's no good. Well, I th I, I, I've done that myself over and over again. When I first, um, um, I had a, a kid in private school, at the same time as Robert Rauschenberg, who's a very famous artist, had his child in private school. And as all these places do, we had fundraisers. His place here has fundraisers, plenty of, you know, we need it badly. And uh, so in, in this fundraiser, the artists, of course, are immediately uh, called upon because we have high ticket items, you know. It's, uh, and there's not too many, uh, you know, gold jewelers who are going to give their, their, their jewelry away for a fundraiser. But artists are always giving pictures away for fundraisers. So I had to pick up Rauschenberg's picture. Well, it was um, about this size, you know. And I looked at it and I said, mm, I don't like it. You know, I don't like it. It's, it's got too much to do with the media because he rubbed f things out of the newspapers and so forth, you know, photographs, so on. Well, I mean, if, uh, and I think the picture then uh, was, was sold for $500. That picture now would be a half a million. You know, it's amazing what, what, uh, what stupidity people have by rejecting, <laughs> by rejecting stuff that's really good, you know. Because now I'm looking at Rauschenberg, I said, well, he's a really, at his best, he's a wonderful artist, you know. But it took me so long. I'm such a slowpoke. All of us are slowpokes. There's very few people who are not slowpokes. My teacher, Hans Hoffman, um, in whose house I lived when I was in school because um, I could translate his, his language into English. Nobody could understand what he said. He'd say things such as, this picture here, Nika, is too bunt. <laughs> and then the people would look at each other, what does he mean, bunt? <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, bunt is a perfectly good German word for which no English word exists. Uh, it means colorful in a disorganized way. You know, Like Joseph had a bunter jacket, you know, a bunter coat, Co coat of many colors. Okay, but a picture shouldn't have many colors. It should just have color, you know, which means an organized kind of sequence of a hierarchy of colors and so forth. And so I would explain that to the people, and in return for that, Hoffman allowed me to be a studio assistant and stay in his house, you know. Um, and um, uh, why did I bring up Hoffman? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, in his house, he had a picture that I thought was a terrible piece of crap. <laughs> it, was all, it was long and it was yellow, and it had these loops of black dribble on it, you know. And I said, what the hell is this? You know. Well, it turned out to be, um, it, this was in 1947, 48. It turned out to be Jackson Pollock, who just arrived on the scene and had gone to Hoffman to show him his work, and Hoffman immediately recognized that Jackson Pollock was doing something extraordinarily important. Namely, he was trying to get rid of the brush stroke, because the brush stroke is loaded with something that the subconscious and the surrealists really don't like, which is intentionality and procedures, you know. We, the brush strokes been with us, you know, since, since Roman times. But uh, to poke a hole into a can of Duco's uh, 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 enamel 
and dribble it around on a yellow surface and make a nice rhythm out of that. That's something that hasn't been done, you know. And so you can, you can allow uh, things to happen that way and get rid that way of intentionality. And that's what Jackson Pollock did. And of course, he, he, by doing that, he liberated a whole lot of people uh, from doing um, things that, that, that had been done before and that were sort of wore out and, and um, uh, didn't have much life left in them, such as the brushstroke. You know? People don't realize how little life is left in the brushstroke. You know? Well, anyway. Um, so what I suggest to all of you, and to myself constantly, is don't have an opinion. Apathy, that's where it's at. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you don't understand it, if it doesn't speak to you, um, if you don't understand the language, you know, why have an opinion? Why, why think of an, a, anything, you know? Um, just, just, just pass it by. And of course, the majority of the world does that to modern art in general. And of course, they're losing a lot by doing that because modern art is doing a lot of very, very important things to our, in our lives. So what does the artist really do? In what sense is the artist useful? Well, I think the artist is a surrogate for the way we should live our lives. Not, not necessarily by, by having an opinion about uh, uh, you know, whether to be a Democrat or a Republican, although I know very well where I stand on that issue, um, as most artists do, because we're all of us good guys, you know. Um, so, um, although I do have two Republican friends in this town, I wonder if they're here. <laughs> Um, at any rate, uh, to get back to serious matters, um, the artist teaches us to get beyond conventional thinking and to distrust order. You know, none of us distrust order. We think that that's really what art's about, is to create new kinds of order. Well. I, I would like to change that and say that the artist's job is to, new, to create new kinds of acceptable disorder. Um, and uh, it was very nicely stated by uh, German poet Novalis, who said that in art, order should barely appear through a screen of chaos. Should barely appear through a screen of chaos, you know. And, um, you know, you, 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 I imagine when people first heard Bach and, and, and this complicated stuff that he came up with, um, they thought that was chaos. When, they first, when first people first heard Stravinsky, which we now can, can take in our stride, you know, there's a lot of people even now who can't take Stravinsky, but um, um, most of us can. But when you first heard Stravinsky, it was awful. You know, people thought it was, was, was cacophony. And in Paris, what they did is they um, threw tomatoes at the, uh, at the orchestra when they first played Stravinsky, you know. All right, so, so that's one of the jobs of the artist is to bring disorder into our lives because there's too much order, much too much order. I mean, look at me standing here in the middle of all this, these steps, by symmetry, this column, that column, you know, this set of lights going that way, this set of lights going that way, the bunch of you s sitting there like, if you all had a gun, you'd be an army, you know? <laughs> so, so the thing is, you know, I mean, in, in an army you have to have order, you know, in order to create real disorder, you know? Um, 
so, so that's one, one, one of the things that we do. Another thing that we do as artists is we represent spontaneity. And again, spontaneity is something that appears very um, infrequently in most of our lives, much too infrequently in mine, you know, because I got to be spontaneous from morning till night if I'm in my studio, and God knows I'm not. You know. Every now and then, like, there's a little flash, and I say, oh, hmm, interesting, you know. But most of the time, I'm, I'm doing... I'm, I'm doing some kind of a routine thing, you know, putting paint on a canvas or um, um, trying to, to, uh, to, to fix a mistake, you know, or, so, or something. But, I mean, we're all of us terribly habit-ridden. And habits and spontaneity, of course, are at great uh, 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 distance from each other. So that the... Um, but you know as an artist that you're not allowed to be habit-ridden because as soon as something becomes a habit, it ceases to be alive. It becomes, it becomes a performance. It becomes something ordinary. It becomes something that's premeditated and thought about and, and um, uh, uh, you know, touched by the pale cast of thought, as, as Shakespeare said, you know. So, so um, one, one of the things a, a, an artist does in his life, in, in, in his um, practice, is to warn people against habit. You can't be an artist and be totally habit-ridden, be totally habitual. Your paintings will immediately show it. Another thing that an artist does is he warns, he warns us against conventional thinking. Now, conventional thinking is, is, is um, something we're all of us terribly uh, uh, burdened by. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, has anybody had a non-conventional thought today? Please raise your hand. <laughs> One, that's wonderful. Two. Three. Oh, well, you know, that's a high percentage in a group like this. <laughs> because most of the time we're thinking, about, you know, operationally, as they say. We're thinking, for example, we're thinking, if we look at a chair, we think about, hmm, I've got a very tired behind. I'd like to rest it on this thing, you know. And you, you think of the chair entirely as what usefulness it is to you. Well, if you look at the chair entirely as, an, as a beautiful object, which of course very few of us are able to do, I mean, it's very difficult not to think operationally. Some people, for example, who care deeply about cars can look at a car as, as, a, uh, as, as something, uh, as an uh, uh, aesthetic object, you know. But there again, like the aesthetics of car uh, design are all conventional. They're all made in order to please an existing taste. You know, a lot of market research is being done all the time to find out what people want. You know, they don't want fins, okay, we take off the fins, you know, so forth. Uh, they, like, they like wheels that, that, that don't have a hubcap, okay, we make a hubcap that looks like a real wheel like the Volvos have, you know, and uh, uh, things like that. So. So e even people who, who are um, crazy about cars have a tendency to, to, to be conventional about their craziness. Mm. Since I don't happen to be crazy about cars, I, I, I disdain those thoughts altogether. You know. I mean, you be crazy about cars, I won't be. You know. To me, it's just an operational thing. It's a conveyance. It's something that gets me from here to there. Um, Okay, then there's other things that, that, that are um, operational. Um, even even uh, uh, looking at a beautiful woman can be operational because you can right away have, have those lustful thoughts, you know, and they're not really aesthetic thoughts, are they? <laughs> you know, you right away think, think, think of, 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 of process, procedures. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So even beauty, uh, beauty is, is, is something that's suspect. <clears throat> and, and as an artist, like one of the jobs is to upset people's normal idea of beauty. You know? Because normal ideas of beauty are very convention ridden. Very convention ridden, you know. And, and, and have to do entirely with the taste of the time and fashion and so forth. Like, for example, in Africa, um, um, a chief chooses uh, for, for his wife the fattest woman in the tribe, you know. Well, I mean, he'd have a wonderful time in Vermont, but, uh, <coughs> but in Africa, you know, where, where people are, uh, are hungry and so forth, to, to have a fat wife is a sign of prestige and status. So uh, in Africa, to be fat is considered to be uh, beautiful. Mm -hmm. and, and in Italy, too. I, I remember... Um, uh, when we first went to Italy after the war, it was in 1957, and they had they had a, a phrase that I still remember. It says "bello grasso," means beautiful fat, you know, "bello grasso." And if they looked at a guy who was nice and you know plump and so forth, "bello grasso," you know. So he too. I mean, the Italians they should have all come to Vermont too. You know, they, they would have been very happy here. Uh, at any rate, and now, you know, I, if, uh, I've been down in, in Palm Beach. And there you see these 70-year-old ladies who go to the gym every morning. And they're like nothing but sinew and bone. It's the most amazing thing. And their hair is tinted, you know. And they, instead of being 70 years old, they look like they're 65. <laughs> Um, now, I'm talking mostly about what art does for the public. Now I'd like to talk a bit what art, art does for, for the artist himself. It's a, um, a health-giving, um, moral, and highfalutin enterprise for the, um, for the practitioner because it uh, First of all, it keeps you out of trouble. A picture is so hard to finish that you, 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 you can't get out of your studio and, and, and do the normal work, so, so you don't bother other people, which is wonderful, you know. They have more time to bother each other. And, um, and you're, uh, another thing is your, your, your um, um, product, really doesn't bother anyone one way or the other except other artists. You know, if, if you're very good, um, other artists get very unhappy. <laughs> and if you're bad, other artists are equally unhappy. So as a result of that, we try to avoid looking at art altogether. <laughs> <laughs> at least you do by the time you're my age. You know, but of course, when you're young, you need to look at a lot of art in order to find out what the tradition is about. And it's very difficult to make halfway decent art without the tradition. You know, because what happens is that you don't understand what the language of art is about until you study good art. People who, who, who practice that language as a matter of course. You know. <clears throat> most artists being looked at, I go back to the public now, most artists being looked at really from a sociological viewpoint. I can tell you a story. I was painting off Route 9 near the uh, wreck vehicle, the uh, uh, RV place, you know, and where they also have uh, those, those huge bricks of cement. Uh, they they've, used to be a nice meadow there. Now, now it's totally uh, industrialized, you know. And um, 
I painted there in this meadow and there was, you know, it wasn't like now where there's a huge amount of traffic. This was about 30 years ago. And um, there was a screech of brakes behind me and this lady comes jumping out of the car, swinging her handbag and looking very angry. And I turned around, you know, and she says, you're not painting that trailer park, are you? <laughs> and I said, no, ma'am, I'm painting that beautiful state police barracks. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she turned around and looked disdainfully at the state police barracks. And she says, I see nothing beautiful about the state police barracks. I said, well, an artist is supposed to see beauty where other people don't, so I'm doing my job. <laughs> but this is an example, again, of people not really thinking about art as art, but they think about it as sociology. You know, by, by saying that as a trailer park, has got to be ipso facto bad description, you know. Um, they're sociologists. They're not. They're not really um, being. They're not really looking at the art or the artist's work in their, in its own terms, but they're looking at it from a social point of view, so that, uh, for example, on the beginning of, and I've suffered from that, um, on the beginning of um, the uh, Pleasant Valley Road, right near um, uh, Meadow, uh, uh, what's, what's the name of the other road? Uh, Meadow Brook Road, there's a sort of an em empty lot with a, a lot of weeds growing in it, and it's got a nice hill in it. And somewhere on that hill, there's an old white trailer. And I think that trailer, trailer is just so nicely situated against all those bushes. And I've done pastels there of that trailer. And um, being an honest person, I didn't make it into a, uh, into a colonial house, but left it a trailer, you know. Now I've got that picture in my, in my inventory for the last 30 years. Nobody wants to buy a picture that has a trailer in it, you know no matter how beautiful it is. And I think it's one of my better pictures, you know. But it's just, that's the way people think, you know. And um, I sometimes been tempted to do nothing but pictures of trailers. <laughs> and in fact, my friend Frank Stout, who had an exhibition here, a previous to mine, um, when he painted, he went out of his way to paint trailer parks and um, uh, uh, abandoned trailers sitting in fields and things like that. He didn't sell any of them. He made no money at all, poor Frank. You know, he had to live on his Marlboro pension, which made him go from thin to thinner. Um, and, and, and the uh, uh, Social Security. Thank God for Social Security, you know. It's another good reason to vote Democrat. <laughs> um, anyhow. Um, so now, what's the misuse from the artist's point of view of his profession? Aside from the fact that uh, you can yourself be influenced by the sociology. Like, I've been influenced because I haven't gone back and made any more pictures of trailers, you know. It's just too painful to have these things clot up your, 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 your storage space in your studio. Nobody wants them, you know. So what, I've, what I would like to say is I feel bad that I don't make pictures of trailers, you know, and pictures of other unpleasant subject matter that people don't like. I have a feeling that as a modern artist, I should be doing things that people don't like because that's what the artists of, 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 of this moment who are being talked about that's what they do. They make pictures that are in your face, that are difficult, that are um, 
uh, uh, surprising in, in, in an unpleasant way. There's a guy named uh, Gober, Grober, who, for example, has, has a, a piece of sculpture which is a, a, a leg and a foot sticking out of a wall with a shoe on it. Hmm? Robert Grober. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I think that's great. Because he's doing his job as an artist, you know, he's 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 uh, uh, ex expanding the the um, the uh, field of allowable and permissible subject matter, and he's actually getting uh, uh, a lot of attention by doing that. And then there's a, a guy who um, in Germany, uh, boys who made uh, a sink and filled it with um, chicken fat, no, uh, uh, pork fat, and exhibited it, you know. And then um, he also did, he also made a mountain of chocolate and exhibited that. And then I have a friend in New York who um, m took a hearse and sawed it in half because he couldn't get a whole hearse into the Whitney Museum. <laughs> So he sawed it in half, which nowadays you can do very easily with all those power tools, you know. And then he stuck it up in the third floor in the Whitney Museum, he covered the whole thing with heavy grease. Well, the whole museum smelled of grease. It smelled like a garage. It was wonderful, you know. It immediately seemed less like a museum, you know, less like a place where, where, where dead people have dead paintings, you know, no matter how much you love them, you know, they are. Um, so, so this 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 uh, young artist um, Nord, uh, had this hearse, which sang. It's great. And then um, uh, I have um, uh, a local who is a sculptor who made um, of shoes and um, pasta. And I think it was exhibited here in the museum.